How should people think about defining philosophy of history? That's number one. And number two is the Taylor line related to historical sensibility being similar to musical sensibility. And if you could just say more about that. The philosophy of history is barely studied or indeed taught. And yet you can't really be an historian without a philosophy of history. You have to understand the nature of causation. These days, nobody bothers with that, which is why a lot of academic history is garbage. I became fascinated by the philosophy of history at that time when I was drinking Chateau Lafitte with Jack Plum and realized that there was a very central problem, namely that any causal statement, this is obvious to philosophers and it's obvious to people who do the law, implies a counterfactual. In other words, if we say that the conversation between Tim Ferriss and Neil Ferguson in November 2022 led to the outbreak of war between China and the United States the following year, that implies that if we hadn't had the conversation, the war wouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. And so the what if question, what if they hadn't had the conversation, is a legitimate question in the same way if you think that Hitler was the key architect of World War II and it wouldn't have happened without him, then it's legitimate to ask what would have happened if Hitler had in fact been assassinated prior to September 1939. So those what-if questions were of great importance to me as a young scholar and teacher. That was how I used to teach students. I would say, well, what if, what if that hadn't happened? What if Britain hadn't intervened in 1914? Taylor was a historian who was sympathetic to that approach. His view was a somewhat skeptical, ironical view that men only learn from history how to make new mistakes. And his <laughs> books are shot through with the, the role of contingency. One of the things that made Taylor attractive to me, in parentheses, was his brilliant prose style, up there with George Orwell as one of mm. the master stylists of the 20th century, and a tremendous master of paradox, and of one-liners too, the line about the 1848 revolutions as being the, the turning point when Germany failed to turn. All that stuff I found exciting because being able to write like that is also the way to convince a reader to be able to talk like that is to convince an audience. So that's how the philosophy of history relates to the style of, of history. The, the second question that you asked about music, his, his assertion that the, the historical sensibility is a bit like the uh, receptiveness to music is, is right. History is not a science. It can't be a science because we can't rerun events in a laboratory and see if consistently war breaks out in 1939 with or without Hitler. So what we're doing when we study the past, as a great Oxford philosopher of history, R.G. Collingwood said, is we're kind of reconstituting past human experience from the bits and pieces that have been left behind. Mm. And as we do that, it's a very subtle process of, of mental reenactment of experience. And I'm not sure that Taylor was wrong to compare it to that, that musical side of, of the human psyche. Interestingly, someone else said much the same thing, a man named Fritz Kramer, who was Henry Kissinger's great mentor uh, during and after World War II. And Kramer said that, that Kissinger had this kind of sensibility. Uh, he was attuned to history. I, I think that's a very, very right. You've got to have the ear for it. Mm. And it's quite obvious when one reads a book, when a historian's tone deaf, and shouldn't really have gone into the business, just as it would be obvious if they tried to conduct an orchestra or play a concerto. So yeah, I think it's much closer to music than it is to science.